Then now I get to introduce T.L. Taylor, who uh, we're really excited to have here because she's not only, uh, I guess, one of the founding s scholars in game studies, uh, certainly someone who's, who's brought game studies alive and, and helped the rest of us in other branches of media, cultural and inter internet studies to understand the significance of issues of identity, participation, regulation in, in online worlds. She's also a fantastic human being. So I'm <laughs> just really personally glad to have here. Uh, she's going to talk to us about ethnography as play. So um, please welcome her. Thanks, Jean, and thanks very much for the invitation to be here. It's, uh, I was actually fortunate my last trip to Australia, I got to visit here very briefly several, quite a few years ago now, maybe almost eight. Um, and uh, so it's nice to be back and I really look forward to the conversations we'll have over the next few days. So the piece I'm presenting today is on, as the head title slide suggests, Ethnography as Play. And I'm going to use my work in massively multiplayer online games as primarily the anchor for this. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with these games. This is like the briefest snapshot overview of some of the kind of fundamentals of them, but they're basically synchronous virtual worlds in which people are playing together in real time. <clears throat> so. Today I want to talk about the relationship between ethnography and play and how, how they may be a kind of kindred spirit. Now this isn't a fully developed article yet, more a piece I've been working with for a few years now, trying to think about my own relationship to my ethnographic practice in play. And I look forward, I don't know how many ethnograph ethnographers we have here today, but I look forward to chatting with you about how my reflections on my own specific practice match, align, resonate, or don't with yours in relation to this conversation. So for me, ethnography has been an incredible tool for studying game culture and really internet culture more generally. It's what I would call sort of resonant. I realize this now, in fact, after completing a large project on esports, which I'll talk about briefly tomorrow in one of the other sessions, that while qualitative was never quite ethnography, I never had that inside feeling. And I think for me, that insideness to ethnography, its embodied and immersive practice, has, I want to argue today, resonance with play. For me, thinking about the relationship between the two is not so much about helping us understand play better, though I think for those of you who aren't in game studies or play scholars, maybe there'll be some interesting tidbits in this presentation about play that you hadn't heard before or weren't familiar with. Uh, for me, though, it's been mostly about thinking about the components of my own ethnographic research. So now when we talk about games, uh, the term fun, <laughs> with air quotes, is commonly used. And I think the notion of fun is a powerful one when we think about playfulness in games. It evokes a sense of often an unhindered pleasure. Sometimes play is spoken of as consequence-free or existing within a magic circle untouched by everyday life. And yet play, even childhood play, with, which is the common, I think, imagined referent point, can be serious, purposeful, contentious, and even painful at times. Even on the face of children at play, we can see them move through joy, intensity, focus, frustration, spontaneity, and experimentation. So I think reducing play to a notion of fun tends to cause us to lose the complexity of the activity and our experience in it. And I think there's some terrific work actually happening in game studies more and more showing that we need to push beyond that notion of fun when we're talking about play. And I'm saying this because I want to signal that grounding what I'm talking about today is something much more than fun. I want to flag, too, that the notion of play I'm working with in this talk is strongly informed, as I've mentioned, by the context of massively multiplayer online gaming. And while there are important connection points to what we might call freeform play, here I'm <clears throat> primarily drawing on a view of play in at least a semi-structured context. And I guess, you know, as a kind of, those of us in game studies may want to have uh, more deeper conversations about how much this model of play I'm talking about coming from MMO maps or doesn't map through other genres. So my hope is to actually move through these topics <laughs> and to do it in a fairly quick amount of time. So beginning. 
Our paths to a game can come in a variety of ways. Perhaps we're a fan of a genre or developer watching for new titles. Maybe we've read about a game, hear about it in a podcast, see it advertised somewhere. Sometimes friends encourage us to pick up a title or suggest we play with them. The ways games are found are as diverse as the people playing them. But somehow we do begin. And once we start playing, we embark on a complex discovery, course of discovery and negotiation. Not only with the game, but just as often with its location in a specific social and cultural milieu. Our choices matter. We're going to play on a PvP, player versus player server, or a role play server. European, guild, with friends, without friends. All of these choices in turn shape how our particular experience, our play, unfolds. It's also the case that our gameplay has some connection with our identities. Multi-user games often prompt the conversation to turn to notions of identity play. And while that's certainly worth considering, I mean something different here. When we play, it's regularly through a lens which evaluates if an activity fits our sense of ourselves, who we can be in our leisure time, what's socially acceptable for someone like us to engage in. Our choices and how we enact them are deeply tied to our identities, constituted not only in private and personal ways, but also refracted through our social context. Of course, we might at times push ourselves out of our comfort zone. If you could think of picking up a game title you might not otherwise, wandering an aisle of your favorite game store that you usually don't go into, experimenting with a new genre, maybe even going into a new game community. In these moments, we, are probably, we probably most closely hit that initial work of the ethnographer as they move into a new domain. Ethnography, at its beginning moment, is, I think, not so different from play. Looking back at my own fieldwork sites, it's hard to always trace a clear path in. It's often filled with advice, happenstance, some intentionality, and just as often as not, serendipity. From the very first moment, it's infused with a sense that I'm now entering something else, something new, though not always entirely unfamiliar. Now, what's most striking to me about reflecting on this is how, on the one hand, I'm using language that seems to evoke a touch of that magic circle we often hear about in game studies. And yet, over time and in practice, I think such a delineation becomes ill-suited to describe the state of things. Rarely have I experienced fieldwork as anything approaching magical. It's fascinating, but it's deeply rooted in the everyday and the mundane. And certainly, one of the most important aspects ethnographers confront is how they negotiate identity in their field sites, playing with the possibilities while still retaining some anchor in this meta-identity of ethnographer. This play takes several forms, from issues of self-presentation to how our very immersion in the space prompts us to think about our own sense of self, values, and ways of being. <clears throat> now, this beginning path leads us deeper into our games. As players, we're constantly experimenting and learning the bounds of the system, its rules and the rules of the community has generated, how, our play, how to play our character and act in the world. While sometimes game manuals are helpful, we often find ourselves continually stumbling upon techniques, skills, tactics that surprise us in delightful ways when they work. We constantly move between axes of control by the game, by ourselves, by other players or game structures, and spontaneity. Most of the time our gaming lives are filled with controlled risk. There's constant movement between discovery, replication, and repetition. As players, we work hard to figure out the system, the rules, the norms, the habits, the shape of that thing. Sometimes we lean on what the game teaches us, sometimes on what we learn from others. Just as often, we fumble and experiment. Our fumbling gets transformed into habit. Tactics are learned and endlessly repeated and refined. And over time, we systematize what we know about how our character works, how it interacts with the world, how it functions in the group. At the same time we're learning how to be a player of the game in the general sense, we're also from day one acculturated into what it means to be a player on a specific server, in a specific guild, in a specific group <coughs> culture. In my work in EverQuest, I playfully riffed on Beauvoir, suggesting that we're not born a player but become one. And I think this is in fact a core principle of gaming. While we learn the general mechanics of gameplay, from the we're also from the outset 
simultaneously embedded in the social context that always informs our actions. People give advice, scold, correct us in different ways. And our actions, as both a player and game community member, our speech, our ways of understanding, are all informed by a deep socialization process. Now, as an ethnographer, our time in the field is also filled with learning, surprise, and discovery. Indeed, the entire process of ethnography is about taking in so much that you can interpret it, can understand it, as well as those living there. We're always being educated about how the system works, discovering new patterns or meanings to things. The closest analog to that game manual I mentioned, perhaps its previous literature, may provide waypoints, but just as often we're trying to track something not yet documented. As ethnographers, we often test our ideas with trusted informants or colleagues risking a dumb question. Sometimes we're lucky and can even run our analysis by those in the field, asking them to critically reflect on an interpretation or theory we're forming. We work hard to watch socialization processes and to uncover the specificities of a particular culture and set of practices. Understanding special language, symbols, and meaning is key to the work of ethnography. But what about this issue of experimentation in play? Is there an equivalent in ethnography? There's a couple ways, I think, to slice this question. One is that from the moment we enter the field, we experiment with various stances to negotiate it. We comport ourselves in ways that secure our entry into the space, managing our self-presentation, right? Laughing, smiling, being silent, being inquisitive, figuring out which is the right modality at which time. We experiment with the ways the categories we inhabit around gender, race, age, sexuality, shape our field time and our interactions with the people there. The second slice, however, I think seems to be the potentially risky, one of the potentially riskier propositions in this comparison I'm making between play and ethnography, because it skirts near the boundaries of ethical dilemmas or concerns about corrupting data. Experimenting with ideas in dialogue with confidants is well within standard practice and certainly one of the key ways we move towards understanding an ethnography. But what about experimenting with ways of being, with action and subjectivity itself? In ethnographic work, we certainly adopt a kind of experimental stance as we try on what it really means to live in that domain alongside our informants. But there is, I think, a much stronger experimental claim that seems to be putting, being put on the table in game studies more and more these days. And that's the dream of virtual worlds as labs. While the formulation of experimentation, while that formulation of experimentation falls outside of ethnography, I think, the possibilities of taking up gender swapping or griefing or certain forms of identity play in online worlds as a way of examining some phenomena can be very tempting. While not an ethnographer, I'm thinking in particular of David Meyer's Twix character in City of Heroes, where in the hopes of revealing something essential about the nature of games, he undertook what he considered a kind of Garfinkel breach experiment that brought down, in fact, incredible ire from the community itself. The possibility then to directly intervene and tweak the conditions of the space, the experience of the world in meaningful ways, presents itself in online, in online spaces in, I think, complicated modes. And it's at this boundary line where the values of play and experimentation, I think, most directly counter the ethical values ethnographers often strive to uphold. So while I've hinted at it a bit, I want to just say a few more words about this idea of experimentation and discovery. While infield discovery is so crucial to ethnography, there's another angle to learning in games that's worth highlighting, and that's the stance the puzzle solver takes. This is an approach that methodically pieces together data to form a total picture, to break down and solve a problem, to master a conundrum. The analytic player may consult a myriad of sources to tackle their game making notes, testing hypotheses, maybe even running hard numbers. And in fact, there's a whole subculture, at least in MMO worlds, about called theory crafting, where you see the analytic puzzle solving stance taken to its utmost. Players in this mode interrogate the underlying game mechanics and structures, comparing them against actual advice and practices of play they encounter. Ethnographic work is, I would argue, also strongly rooted in this tendency as well. <coughs> We try to keep an eye on structure and process, while at the same time paying keen attention to everyday practices and culture. While we do important work when we enter the field and while we're in it, certainly at that stage where we sit with our pages of notes 
and hours of interview tapes, puzzling through the pieces, shuffling data